Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Dr. April Armstrong. I'm Associate Dean for Clinical Research and Director of Clinical Research Support at the Southern California CTSI. I'm also a dermatologist by training. Today I am very excited to talk to you about clinical trial implementation and support at USC. When we think about the natural life cycle of a clinical trial, there are a few steps that we think about. It starts from the designing of your study, to obtain funding, to activate your study, to conducting your study, and finally, when you get the results, you want to analyze the data and disseminate these results. Now, any time along this particular pathway, you may face challenges. And here I'm going to talk to you about some of the important things to look out for when you're planning your study, when you're activating your study, and also importantly, what services are available at USC that will help you to succeed in terms of conducting your study. So first, study planning. Now, study planning can be quite complicated, especially when we're talking about a clinical trial or prospective study that involves human subjects in which you are testing an intervention prospectively. Now, when we think about study planning, protocol is the absolute guide for the conduct of the clinical trial. And there should be no voluntary deviations or violations, except you see there's a safety issue with a patient or patient's interest is at stake. It is very important to know that it is difficult to actually develop a protocol from scratch if you've never done it before. Therefore, oftentimes it's helpful to follow a template to make sure that you have all the essential elements that go into a protocol. I want to give you a few advice on this particular front. First, NIH actually has clinical trial protocol templates that you can follow to make sure that you have the protocol complete in terms of the various sections that are required. If you have worked with sponsors before, you will know that oftentimes sponsors have their own protocol for the various clinical trials. You could take a look at their previous protocol and use that as a potential example for designing new studies. If you have a mentor who is guiding you through this particular process, you can ask your mentor for a protocol that they've used in the past, especially in a similar disease area or similar study design, such that you can reference their protocol and use that to help you think about how you want to organize your protocol. Finally, it is very important to enforce a protocol among all research staff. This is because we want to ensure that even if the protocol is carry out, carried out by different people, it is important that the same procedures are done. When you're planning your study, one of the key questions is, how many patients should I recruit into my study? So this has to do with really thinking about the power of your study and the sample size calculation. Now, we may not be equipped with all the skills that are necessary for conducting that in terms of study planning, especially if you're thinking about a complicated study design. Therefore, it's useful to obtain biostatistics support at USC. Here you'll see a link in which you can be connected to the biostatistics consultation core here, which can be help quite helpful. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see that there are standard rates for which uh, that are available to our investigators. Now, when we think about study planning, in addition to the protocol, there are a few other tools that you want to include. And these are tools that are essentially documents that can help you organize your study and ensure that it's carried out in a methodical fashion. For example, eligibility worksheet is very helpful to make sure that the patients you enroll fulfill the inclusion and exclusion criteria. You want to have a detailed study calendar so that your patients as well as your study staff will know exactly when a subject is supposed to come for the visit and also when certain procedures are done for each visit. You may want to consider a concomitant medication sheet so that you're aware of all the medications that the patients are taking and also that they're not on any prohibitive medications uh, that the protocol may not allow. You also want to consider having a toxicity or adverse event assessment sheet 
This is very helpful in terms of thinking about collecting particular adverse events of interest, for example, that's related to a particular medication that you're testing. There's also drug and device accountability forms that may be required by the sponsor or by the pharmacy or by the uh, regulatory bodies. And finally, it is important to have a serious event uh, or serious adverse event log to keep track of potential serious events that occur as a result of taking a particular medication. Now, the slides that I showed before are helpful tools that help you organize your study. Uh, this slide shows certain regulatory documents that typically go into a binder we call the regulatory binder that is essential and oftentimes required for clinical trials. And this regulatory binder contains these particular uh, documents. So for example, the FDA 1572 form that's required of all investigators, copies of PI and sub-investigators CVs, IRB approved informed consent form as well as protocol as well as advertisements that have been approved. And finally, any amendments that have been made since the protocol was initially written need to be included in the regulatory binder. Copies of lab certifications and normal ranges are typically required to be included and also an investigator brochure and IND safety reports are included. So why do you need to keep all these regulatory documents? It's very important for both monitoring reasons as well as auditing reasons. When you have monitors that come to your site and take a look to ensure that your site is continues to be qualified for the study, uh, they typically take a look at the regulatory binder um, at uh, every visit to ensure that you have all these uh, required documents that are in there. And also, when you experience an audit from the FDA, they certainly want to take a look at those regulatory documents as well. Now, when we think about how to organize charts around each individual subject, it is recommended to be best practice to have a separate research chart for each subject. The reason for this is because we want to ensure that by having a separate research chart, you will be compliant with the protocol, that you have adequate documentation. And believe it or not, having separate research chart for each individual subject actually enables more efficient study con conduct. I can tell you that uh, oftentimes if an investigator puts multiple subjects documentation into, let's say, a single chart or a single binder. What happens is that oftentimes in the daily conduct of the study visits, different pieces of uh, information or document can actually get mixed up between subjects. And that's something that we want to avoid. And also, if your study uh, is being monitored or being audited, typically this is a best practice that they prefer you to do. Now, what goes into each individual subject research chart? Here's a list that's helpful for you to think about the various documents that need to go into that. And some of those we've already reviewed earlier. Something that's important for each individual subject research chart are what's called case report forms, as well as supporting documents. In some slides later on, I will talk about these uh, two types of documents in more detail, but it, for now, it is important to know that they need to be in there in our individual subject research charts.